Does anybody know where we're going to be today? The Bible. There we go. I like it. I like it. Let's go to Ruth. Old Testament, right after Judges. It's only about four, four chapters. Has anybody here ever read the book of Ruth? Raise your hand if you've read the book of Ruth. Oh my. You can read it in 15 minutes. Probably one of the best books in the Old Testament. You cannot miss out on this book. And if you've never read it, after today, if you listen, you will have read it. Because I'm going to read the whole book. Verse, every verse. Okay? Every verse. I know, right? It only takes 15 minutes. Everybody's like, I can't study chapters at a time. It'll take hours. It only takes 15 minutes. I mean, it's like five. Yeah, right? Right? Half. It's like a tenth. That's a tithe of my sermon. So last week, in the last previous three or four weeks, we've talked a lot about God's judgment, His wrath, and We've still, we've, I've seen a scarier part of sight of God that I've never realized before. And, and I was like, Lord, because I told my wife this week, I was like, I think I'm going to have to preach something different because this is like four sermons in a row about God's wrath and his judgment. And I was like, I don't know if I can handle any more of this. And so, and then I realized uh, what we were going to be preaching. I was like, oh, no, God's got it. This is going to be perfect. So, uh, so we're me and Ruth. Now, this story... Uh, is a story of love, is a story of devotion, and it's a story of redemption. It's a story of love. Um, well, you'll see it very clearly. You'll see the love in this, in this book. You'll see the devotion, the devotion of uh, Ruth to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And you will also see uh, redemption as the kinsman re- redeemer, their family member, um, is able to redeem um, Ruth through the death of her husband. She lost her husband, lost everything. So her kinsman, her redeemer, comes through, uh, basically buys the property, marries her, and everything is good again. Um, and so it's, uh, it's really a huge contrast from what we've been studying. But uh, story of Ruth, she's a Moabite uh, woman. And um, the thing you need to realize is the Israelites and the Moabites didn't really um, want to, didn't really want to marry each other. They didn't want to be, they didn't, be, they didn't want to, uh, cohabitate, uh, and actually there's some verses in Deuteronomy that indicate God saying not to marry Moabite, Moabites up to the 10th generation. Well, we're past that now, so now it's okay, but uh, so uh, the member of the Moabites, uh, the, the ruler of the Moabites called in the magicians to put uh, curses on the Israelites, so it wasn't a good relationship anyway. Um, so it's another one of those things that, you know, why'd they even get married? They didn't even like each other. Well, it's another story of God just uh, interested in the details of our life and uh, maneuvering us to where we need to be. So Ruth, she's a Moabite woman. Uh, she forsakes, this is the thing, she forsakes her family and her family's heritage and her pagan past to cling to the God of Israel and to the Israelites' God. Okay, she, her mother said go. She said, I don't want to go. I want to go with you. I want to be with your people. I want to be with your God. And... Um, and so we also find that very interesting. She didn't have to. She didn't have to stay with her mother-in-law. Her, her husband died. She was released. She could, have been, she could have gone like the other sister-in-law. We also see a blessing upon her with her new husband. She has a new husband, new son. And now she has a position in the lineage of uh, King, not only King David, but Jesus Christ. So this is a beautiful story. Uh, the story takes place during the time of the judges. So la- the last sermon we, we talked about, the, all the dark uh, uh, destruction, God turning them over to be destroyed. All of this is happening during that time. God sees a ray of hope in this woman, uh, not only in this woman, but her mother-in-law, probably who taught her how to be the woman she is. Um, uh, Proverbs 31 explains uh, Naomi uh, very well, and she was a good teacher, obviously good enough to want to keep Ruth around. Okay, So it's very important that we understand that our style, our teaching, our life can make a difference even if we're not even trying to make a difference. It can make a difference if we'll just live right and talk right and breathe right and eat right and live right. Just do what God has called us to do. Now, eating right doesn't matter. You don't have to eat right to be a Christian, but you know what I'm saying. Just living right. And uh, uh, with all the harshness we've seen with the Israelites and their own disobedience, it's really a breath of fresh air to come and see this story. Um, 
this great love story, not only between uh, Ruth and Boaz, but it also shows us a picture of our kinsman redeemer. And that's what we're going to look at the very end, uh, is the picture of Jesus redeeming us, because Jesus is our brother. God is our father. Jesus is looked at as our brother. He can redeem us, and we'll get into the definition of the kinsman redeemer uh, right now. The kinsman redeemer, he is a male. It has to be a male uh, family member. And it has, it has to be um, uh, according to various, uh, there's, there's, there's various laws in the Pentateuch that talks about the kinsman redeemer. Uh, and the kinsman redeemer had the privilege or the responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, danger, or in need. Okay? And then being in trouble and in danger and need describes us to a T before salvation. Even if you were a good sinner, you're still not good enough. You still are in trouble, you're still in danger, and you're still in need. And that's what Jesus, our brother, has done for us. He has sacrificed himself so that he could be our redeemer. Amen? Amen. So the Hebrew term uh, for kinsman redeemer is goel. It is one who delivers or rescues or redeems property or person. Okay? So um, uh, just as Boaz does for Ruth. So I'm going to read a lot. Okay, just get ready. I'm going to read chapter 1, verse 1, going all the way through chapter 4. So, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of their two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephratites uh, of Bethlehem, uh, Judah, and they went to, con- uh, to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the other one was Ruth, and they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died, so the women survived her two sons and her husband. So the woman's husband dies, she has two sons, she marries her sons to Ruth and... Um, Orpah, and the two sons die. So daddy's dead, two sons are dead. Three women all alone. And so Naomi tells the, le- the, the girls, go back to your homes. There's nothing I can offer you. I have no husband. I have no more kids for you to marry. There's nothing. You have nothing here. So Orpah left. Ruth said, I'm staying, okay? So this is where we're at. Chapter, uh, verse 6. The, then she arose with her daughter, daughter-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Where did she hear that from? Where did the Lord give his people bread? Anybody know? The wilderness? What did he do? He provided manna. She heard this. She wanted that. Now, does God want, does anybody want uh, to be with God? Because he is a provider. Do you want to be God, with God? Amen. He, is a pro- he is a provider. He will provide for you. He'll give you food. Uh, so much that stories and stories and stories have been told around the world of God providing. People can sit down. At, I've heard of orphanage sitting down at the dinner with no food. And every time they sit down at the table, someone brings food for them to eat. I mean, the trust of loving, loving God and living for God can make a huge difference in your life. Unless you're the person that wants to take care of it yourself. And then, by the way, good luck. Therefore she went out from the place where she was and and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each one to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you. To your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? There are still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands. Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should if I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for then till they are grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, and Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister's-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. 
But Ruth said, now this is, a, this is a passage that a lot of people use in their marriage ceremonies. Uh, we use it in ours. Um, but this is, uh, this is probably one of the most, this is definitely one of the most, probably the most two famous verses in Ruth. Entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following you. So, so Naomi was trying to convince Ruth to go. Just, just go. Go with your other sister-in-law. Go, go, go. And here's Ruth's response. Entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death parts you and me. This is a great passage. This really shows the devotion of Ruth. She was devoted. I mean, she had it settled in her mind. Now, She's a lot different than the modern day Christian because the modern day Christian really doesn't settle much in their mind. They just go to church and hope that it works out. It is time for the church to settle in their mind that first of all, we're Christian, okay? And second of all, we need to act like Christian, okay? If we are devoted, if we are Christian, we should act like Christians. We should act like Christ. That's what it means to be devoted. Not only why, not only saying that you're going to do something, but people seeing that you're doing something. You know, it's always talked about it's better to do than to say. I'm saying it's better to be seen than to say. Why? Jesus said they will know your love. They, the world, will know your love for one another. By, uh, they, the world will know me by your love for one another. So it has to be seen. God made it to where we not only say it, we believe it, but we need to be seen doing it. Now... Can I convict you this last week of being a Christian? Can I look at your life and I say, guilty, you did it. You are the Christian. If not, why not? I mean, what's so much, what's so much more important than being Christian? Anybody? Give me, some, give me something. Is there anything in here more important than being a Christian? No. Well, are we guilty? Can we, be pro- can we prove that's what we believe? Can we prove that by our lives? Well, Ruth... Ruth was devoted. She was determined. She did not want anything, but she seen something in Naomi that she had to have. What was it? Her people and her God. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Something about her was, was, was strong enough for this young, pretty girl to stay with her mother-in-law, who she didn't have to. When she, uh, verse 18, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, Naomi stopped speaking to her. She saw she was determined. She was determined. When's the last time you were determined to do something? Did you get it done? When you were determined to do something, do you get it done? Do you get it done if you're determined? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. How many are determined to be Christians today? I mean, how many are going to take it to the point of, I have to get this done? I have to. Why? Not for anything, but to please God. God uses you as an example for others. How many are determined today? Are you going to be determined? How many determined parents do we have? How many determined spouses do we have? How many determined workers do we have? How many determined Christians, church members? Are you determined? Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem, that all the cities were, all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? Now, they knew Naomi was coming. Now, I think Naomi had a few things up her sleeve here. I really believe that, that Naomi was such a good witness that, that, uh, that Ruth not only wanted to cling to her people and her God, but she was convinced that God, uh, that, that there was something better uh, coming. I mean, Naomi did send her out in the right direction. She did tell her about her, her kin that could redeem her and her property. And so I think uh, not only did Naomi believe, not only did, did Naomi have uh, a faith, but she was also smart about her actions and what she did with her life in the direction she, she pushed her daughter-in-law. But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. She changed her name. She changed her name to Bitter. 
She went from friend, uh, no, that's Ruth. Ruth is friendship, right? Or is Naomi friendship? Naomi is pleasant. Naomi is pleasant. Okay, so Ruth must, Ruth's definition of her name must have been friendship. So Naomi went from pleasant, and she changed her name to bitter. To bitter. Why? She said, God's dealt bitterly with me. Not only took my husband, took my two sons, took my inheritance, took my uh, everything. Now, when bad things happen in our lives, most people want to, uh, you know, kind of get down and, and, and uh, think that God's not really for them. But you see, when God deals with us, a lot of the times we have to have bad things happen. A lot of times God has to use those bad things to get our attention, to get our mind, to turn our heads. Okay? She would have stayed there had these bad things not happened. What, what would have happened to the lineage of Jesus? She is in the lineage of Jesus. Okay? Now, I'm sure Jesus would have still been born, but it had been different. God chose to use them. Why? They were determined. Obviously, Ruth was determined. Naomi shut her mouth and said, I'm not going to talk you out of it anymore. You're determined. You're going. Okay? I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me? She thinks God's against her. God's for her. She's just not seeing it, and a lot of times we don't. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabites, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, where they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. There was a a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth... The Moabites said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So they didn't have any food. Uh, They didn't didn't have anything to eat. So Ruth said, Let me go into the field. Let me go glean. Gleaning is taking some of the leftovers. So once the the harvesters came through, anything that was left over, big or small, uh, gleaners could come through so they wouldn't starve and they would eat. Okay, they would, they would go pick stuff off the ground, pick little things off the plants. Whatever was left over, they would, they would put. Now, um, it's also good to know that um, Boaz made sure and told his harvesters, make sure and drop some on the way. I don't want her to work very hard. I want you to drop some so that her and her mother will So automatically, first, I mean, first time we see her going to the field, trying to find someone to let her glean in their field, she's already, she's already coming back with food. So obviously God has just began this, uh, this walk, this walk of faith, this walk of determination, whatever you want to call it, and he's beginning to bless her, and he's beginning to put things in the right order, okay? Not everything happens overnight, does it? No, it's taken me 32 years to get here, right? Didn't happen overnight, 32 years, okay? It took the Israelites 40 years to get through the wilderness just to get the next generation into the promised land. Sometimes it takes time, right? So Ruth, the Moabites, said to Naomi, Please let me go a field glean heads of grain after him whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging Boaz. Do you think she just happened to come upon that field? I think God was directing her the whole time. Even with the deaths of her husband and her father-in-law, God was still directing her past. Why? Because there's always a bigger picture. Yes, death hurts. I understand. And losing... Uh, a dad or a brother or a sister, I, I'm sure it hurts. I, I'm, I'm absolutely sure it hurts. But, but a lot of the details in our lives, um, we may miss, but God's always interested in those little details. Okay? It gets us to the next point. Whatever that point is, I don't, know what for, you know, I don't know what the point is for you, but God gets us to that next level. And sometimes there's pain involved. Okay? Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after her reapers, and she happened to come to a part of the field belonging to Boaz, happened to, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered answered him, The Lord bless you. 
Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge, he's like, whose young woman is this? He must be an older guy, right? <laughs> kind of like me and my wife here. Whose young woman is this? <laughs> then Boaz said to the servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. At this point, he knows. Why? Everybody else knew she was in town. Everybody else knew Naomi was coming. They were excited. They knew the stories. Boaz heard. What was Boaz doing? He was looking. He was looking. And she said, please let me glean and, glean, uh, and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and she continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor come from here, or... I'm sorry, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. He's already made, he's already, he's already setting things up. He said, this is mine, this is my girl, leave her alone. Don't look at any other fields, don't look at any other men. I've told them not to touch you. And this is, this, is part of, this is part of his wooing process. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna have to confess. When I read this verse, this, this verse really broke my heart because I know the contrast between uh, Boaz as the kinsman redeemer and Jesus as the kinsman redeemer. But when you ask... This question, as you're asking it to God, it makes a total difference in your heart. Why have I found favor in your eyes? God, why have I found favor in your eyes that you would do this for me? What, what's, so, what's so great about me that you would do the things that you've done for me? And this helps me understand this love relationship with God. He doesn't love me for what I have to offer. Okay? He loves me from what his son had to offer. He, he let his son offer everything. I didn't have to offer anything. He doesn't need anything like he needs something. It's not, a, it's not an issue of need. It's an issue of desire. God desires to have a relationship with us. He desires this. That you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner. And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me that all you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people you did not know. This is so important to understand. This is her testimony. This is what she's left uh, as a witness of her name. Okay? As her, of her name. If I was to go out into the community and say, Hey, Johnny Ketchering, what do y'all got to say? What anybody got to say about Johnny Ketchering? Does he have a good witness? The, I mean, I know he has a good witness here. It's church. Everybody has a good witness here. I'm not interested in what you do here. I'm interested in what you do out there. Yeah. What, what defines you? What's your name? If I bring up your name, what, what are we going to find? Well, Boaz, he said, I've heard your story. I've heard that you stayed when your husband died. I've heard that you took care of your mother-in-law. What a good testimony. What a good witness. What a good testimony she's left behind for others to see and hear it's not about just saying it yeah i took care of my mama you know a lot of people talk about what they do yeah i did this i did that hey quit leave your name out of your mouth let other people do it if they have something to find let them do it but it's important that we have a good testimony why this has encouraged boaz to to pursue her now do you think he would have pursued her if she was uh if she was a backstabbing uh, in-law, no. No, probably not. Who in, who in their right mind is seeking after someone to marry that's, that's horrible? Yeah, I want them. They're bad. <laughs> no. I mean, if you do, I'm going to be praying that God will just change your mind because that's just weird. But no one's really seeking after someone that's going to harm them or hurt their lives. They're seeking after someone that's going to help them. That is, that is something they want to be seen with. The character. The 
verse 12, The Lord repay your work and get a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. When she was in trouble, who did she go to? Who did she go to? The Lord. Lord. She's seeking refuge from God's people and from God. She wanted to be around God. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and you have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and she passed parched grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose again to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also, let grain fall from the bundles purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephath of barley. Then she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today, and where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is, is relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabite said, He also said to me, You shall stay close to my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with 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 his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young woman of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So Naomi already knows where Boaz is going to be. She's doing her homework. (laughs) She is. She knows where he's going to be. She is not trying to uh, do God's work for him. Uh... She is doing God's work. God is, has God not called us to do His work? He wants us to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Is it a bad thing that she said, I know where Boaz is going to be, going to be, go to him? No, this is part of God's plan. God got him out of their place, got him into a new place. God put him around new people, put him in the right fields, gave him to the right person. Obviously, God is for this. Okay? She's not sitting on her couch well, I guess I'll just let God do what He does. God's got this. I don't have to do anything. The important thing is, God does have it, and He wants you to do something about it. Yeah, He does. Now Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter shall not seek security for you, that it may be well with you. Now Boaz, whose young, whose young women were with is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down. She's saying, why don't you go dress up, look a, look a little hotter. Don't get, get, your, get your black clothes off, your, uh, your uh, um, morning clothes. Get your morning clothes off, okay? You're not in mourning an- anymore. Go ahead and show them that you're available. That's what she was saying. Show them you're available. Clean up. Then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies and you shall go in, uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, all that you say to me I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law instructed her. And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she said, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservants under your wing make take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after younger men, whether rich or poor. 
he purposely put her, remember, he, he purposely put her with young, younger men. He said, stay with my young men. So um, obviously he's, he's older. Um, obviously he's, he's, he's more advanced in age. And she was not interested in anything but what? God's, God's will, God's purpose. She knew the plan of the kinsman redeemer, and she wanted her and her land to be redeemed. And she wasn't interested in anything else. Why is it so easy for us to be interested in everything else but God? Why is it so interested to be interested in all of life? Well, I'm only here for a little bit. I want to live life. I want to be happy. You know, there's nothing here that's going to give you happiness. I'm just sorry. No, no. Things here will give you happiness. Happiness comes from happenings. When things happen, we have an emotional feeling. Don't rely on the shallowest part of your life, your emotions, to keep you going. Okay? It's not about being happy. It's not about, uh, it's not about that. It's about, it, it, is about, it is about living in obedience according to God's will. Okay? Nothing else is ever going to bring you a peace. You can say, well, I'm at peace right now. Well, Try some of Jesus. You'll really find out what peace is about. Um, Verse 10, then he said, Blessed are you, the Lord my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end of the, at the, than at the beginning. You did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will not do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. Now it is true that I am close, a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will, not, he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform this duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. Lie down until morning. Now, this issue of them being married and uh, obviously is not pertained to an emotional feeling of love, right? Because she's not saying, they're not saying, oh, I love you, I love, you know, and, and they're not saying any of that. They're, they're, they're more interested in doing the duties that they were called to do, okay? And this love is, an, love is an issue of doing certain duties that you don't necessarily want to do or have to do. Love is more than, once again, don't, don't rely on the shallowest part of yourself, the emotional part, to be in love. That's not, that's not love. Love is way deeper than that shallow part. Yeah. Way deeper. It goes way deeper. It's a commitment. It is, uh, it is something, it is duties to perform. Does any, does any uh, husbands or wives in here like to do dishes? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a couple. Now, for the another 99%, these are duties we perform out of love. What about laundry? Anybody love doing laundry? Same people. That's funny. Same people. Uh, Who are these people? Yeah. <laughs> Laundry is something, is a duty you perform out of love. You're determined to make it work. You're determined to make your family work. You're determined to make your house work. What about punishing kids? Anybody like doing that? I knew we'd see more hands on that one. <laughs> Once again, duty to perform. You've actually been called to do that. I tried to convince somebody the other day that the verse doesn't say, if you spare the rod, you'll spoil the child. I tried to convince him that says, spare the rod and spoil the child. Yeah. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. It's funny, though. Um, verse 14. So she lay at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. I don't ever do that. Rise before anybody could recognize me? Nope. Then she said, do not let it be known that this woman came to the threshing floor. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then she went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her. And she said, these six ephahs of barley he gave me, for he said to me, do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day. Chapter 4. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there and beheld the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken by. So Boaz said, come aside, friends, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down. Now this is... 
This is the relative that was closer that had the option of marrying uh, Ruth first. Okay. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. And I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants of the elders of the people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. So Boaz has got this man in front of all the elders. Okay, why? Because not everybody that says they're going to do something actually does it. He wanted to make sure there was witnesses, okay? Because he was about to perform the duty if this guy didn't, okay? So it's important. Not everybody that says yes means yes. I know it's sad, but it's true, okay? And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants of the elders of the people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am the next after you. And he said, I'll redeem it. Whoa, what do you mean you're redeeming? I thought Ruth married Boaz. What happened? Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of, hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through the inheritance. Okay, so now he can't just buy the land. He's also got to take care of the mother-in-law and the wife. He's not interested. He says, what? And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it. Before he can redeem it. Now he can't redeem it. Okay, so there's, there's a few things that could go on. Maybe he didn't have enough money to support everybody. Maybe he just wasn't interested in taking care of a, a Moabite. It, was, it wasn't a good thing for them to marry Moabites. Maybe he didn't want to do that. Uh, maybe he didn't want to split the inheritance. Maybe he was too gre greedy with his money didn't want to split inheritance with another family. Okay, I mean, all of these make sense. But it wasn't until the ladies came into the picture that he said, I don't want to buy it. What does that tell you about Boaz? He's not interested in just what works out for him. Okay? He's interested in the good of all men, in this case women. He's going to take care of the mother-in-law. He's going to take care of his new wife, Ruth. Okay? He's going to split the inheritance. He's going to gain more land. Okay? He's not looking at this as an investment. Okay? He, from the very beginning, has been looking at her character. He said, this is the kind of person you are. This is what I'm interested in. I like this. Tanya asked me before we got married, why do you want to marry me so much? I said, well, this is going to be weird. Okay, tell me. I said, I've never seen someone love Jesus the way that you do, and I need that in my life. I need that around me. And she goes, is that it? I said, no, it's not it. <laughs> well, that's the first thing. Honestly, it was the first thing. I was like, wow, I've never seen a young girl want to follow Jesus. I think I need this. I think I need this around me. I wasn't, wasn't just interested in uh, physical qualities. Okay? I was interested in the character, the heart. Why? Well, because if you don't pay attention close enough to the heart, you can be deceived and end up divorced years down the road. And it's just not a good thing. Divorce is just torturing our, our churches. It's torturing our communities. It's torturing our families. So it's important that you see the character behind the person. Not what you see, but it's the things you don't see that you need to be looking for. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Verse 7. Now this was the custom in the former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to another, and this was confirmation in Israel. So he took off his right sandal. The other person took off their right sandal. They ch exchanged sandals, had two different sandals on. This was done in front of all the elders. This went, it was a done deal. Okay? Done deal. Therefore, the close relative to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he took off his sandal. Okay? He said, you have my permission. Go ahead and redeem him. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and all that was Malon's from the hand of Naomi. So 
Boaz could redeem it. Okay, he could physically. Uh, he could he could he could afford it. Uh, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the woman of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through the inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his possession, his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So him, by being a kinsman, now if anybody else would have married her, the name of her ex-husband, the dead husband, would not have lived on. This was the important role of Boaz in knowing what he could do to keep her husband's name to live on is being the kinsman redeemer. Okay, this is what God, this is what Jesus does for us. He helps, he helps our heritage live on by putting our trust in him. Verse 11, all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses, the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in... Uh, in Ephrathath, and be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to the Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel." And he may be you, to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also, the neighbor woman gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse and the father of David. So, this... Son from Boaz and Ruth is the grandfather of King David. Okay, this is this is a great story. Um, none of this stuff would have happened had they not been so adamant on getting back to the land where God provides, where getting back to the God who gave bread. When they were hungry, who did they go to? Bread. Went to God. Why? They were hungry. God provides. You say, well, God's not providing. He's providing. He is providing, always. Now, we may do too much with what he's providing and, and still be broke, but he's providing. I don't see anybody in here that's really poor. If you make, 20, if you make fifteen dollars to $20,000, you're in, you're, you're in like the top 85% of the richest people in the world. Okay? Being poor... Uh, is nothing in the United... No one here is poor. No one here in, the, in our country is poor. Um, we are spoiled. We are. We get everything we want, anytime we want. If we, don't, if we can't get it, the government will get it for us. We're spoiled. Okay? We need to be determined to do these things and not depend on others to take care of us. We need to be going and, and pushing and finding God's plan and making sure that we are the ones determined to make sure we get there. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Abinadab, Abinadab begot Naashon, Naashon begot Salmon, uh, Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, Jesse begot... David. Okay. You see how you can come from a nothing and all of a sudden God's put you in a royal family? Yeah. And it all comes from obedience. It all comes from having the right character, having the right mindset, having the right morals, having the right understanding of what your morals are, what direction you should go when things happen. When, when bad things happen, what do you do? Where do you go? Who do you talk to? It's all important, all these things, all these details of life are important. Yes, I know we have bad things happen all the time, okay? I'm going to tell you, so I'm on a job, okay, I'm a, I've been on my last job as a, as a, as a, as a, as a going into a full-time, I've been on my last job for four weeks, a job that should have taken me three days. Do you know how important it is about the details? God is making sure I know this better be my last job or this is what's coming in the future. I'll never finish a job. Not, I'm not lying. He has already showed me. 
this is what it's going to be. You, you, you do what you want to do, this is how you're going to have to live it. Right. Same thing for you. You feel stressed out, you feel anxious, you feel like nothing's going right. Maybe you're just not doing the right things. Because yeah. I promise you, I promise you, these last three or four weeks have been the most, probably the hardest weeks of my life. Not only have I been trying to finish a job that won't stop, I've got off my prescription medicine for, that I've been on for three and a half years. Okay, this is the third week I'm going into now. Okay, the anxiety that I had with getting off of it, gone. The last two or three days have been great. What's going on? I'm looking for the correct direction. I am looking for the right path. I am trying to find out what direction God wants me to go in. Amen. I promise you this, I'm not doing any more fences. <laughs> this fence is the fence that's going to kill me. I'm not lying. Is it the fourth week? Is it the fourth week? Fourth week, between rain, which God controls, <laughs> between rain, uh, pain, um, plans, previ- the, like plans that I made months before that I didn't think, oh, that ain't nothing going to get in the way of that. Everything that can go wrong is going wrong. I got to have this thing done tomorrow. I got two days worth of work to do in one day. Is it going to get done? I hope so. <laughs> if not, I'll be there Tuesday working in the rain. So, does following God's path make a difference? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. God's proven to me, if I don't do what he's called me to do, it's going to be heck in my life. It's going to be chaos. Maybe there's chaos in your life because you're on the wrong road. Maybe you think, oh, life's okay. If that's your, if that's your answer, it's chaos. Life can never just be okay. It has to be more than that. Who wants to live life just uh, okay? They want to wake up and just have an okay spouse? Okay kids? No. Why, why would we... Yeah. Why, why would we settle for that? Why would we settle for anything but God's best? Now, do you see a different story in Ruth than you have the last seven or eight books? Yeah. It's, 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 it's the same... God, it's the same people, but it's the character and the heart of the person that's making the difference, the, 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 what she's interested in, what they were interested in. Now, I don't know what you're interested in. I hope you're interested in doing things for God. If not, it'll be obvious. It really will. It's so obvious for those who do God's will and those who don't care. It's obvious. Don't ever think you're deceiving anybody because you're not. It is obvious who wants God's will blessing in their life. Here's how it's obvious. You do, what you, you do what you're supposed to do. You just do it. You don't have to be talked into it. You don't have to be beat into it. You do it. It matters. All right, let's, uh, let's bow our heads for a second. I want to close out with this. Holy smokes, I did it before noon. <laughs> don't clap. All right, close your eyes. Kids, be quiet. Close your eyes. Okay, God is Israel's redeemer. He promises to defend and vindicate them. He is their father. He is their deliverer. He is the rescue. He rescues the weak and he rescues the needy. In the New Testament, Christ is regarded as the example of, his, of, the, of a kinsman redeemer. He is our brother. Jesus redeems us because of our great need that only he can redeem. If we look back into Ruth, we see she is in need. She is unable to rescue herself and ask a kinsman redeemer to cover her with, her with his protection, redeem her, and make her his wife. In the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ brought, bought us for himself out of the curse of sin. Jesus makes us his own bride, the church, and wants, us, wants to bless us. Jesus is the true kinsman redeemer of all who call on Him in faith. If you have never called on Jesus before in faith and you have never put your trust in Him, don't let any other day go by. There's not a a better picture of the kinsman redeemer and His love for you. Why you. Why would you want to not make that commitment today? If you are not a Christian and you need to be born again and you want to make that commitment, please make that commitment today and don't go any farther. If you're not a Christian, please become a Christian today. Now, 
with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, please, I want, to, I want to talk to the person who is lost. I want to talk to the person who is confused. I want to talk to the person who is not walking with Christ. There is so much more in this life than what we think there is. If we will take the time, if we will take the, 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 the things that God has given us, His Word, His Scriptures, His people, if we will take these things seriously, God will seriously show us who He is. Anybody that will serious, take God seriously at His Word, God will take them seriously as well. Now, I don't know if anybody in here is lost or not, but if you're not a Christian, today is the day that God will save you. He wants you to put your trust and your faith in Him. He wants you to turn away from what you believe life is about and trust Him, even if you don't know the plan, but trust Him for His plan for your life. Now, if you need to be a Christian and you need to be saved, please, I'm going to give you this time to make that, make that commitment. If you want to talk with somebody and counsel with somebody, let, please raise your hand. I will send somebody to talk to you. Okay, Vanessa, you go talk to this lady back here. Okay, is there anybody else in here that needs to talk to somebody, counsel somebody about salvation? Salvation is the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. Okay, if you are not a believer, it's okay. It's where everybody starts. If you need to be a Christian and you need counseling, please raise your hand. I'll send somebody to talk with you. Okay, and if not, if you are lost and you don't want to make that decision, I'm, I want to pray for you and I want you to make sure that you ask God and you get desperate enough to ask God to help you and to give you what He knows that you need. You know, God guided the steps of Naomi all the way through the death of her sons, all the way through the death of her husband. God was guiding her steps. God, does, God was not forsaking her. God was not punishing her, although she thought it was punishment. God's plan was to give her more of an inheritance than she was ever going to have. Give her more in her life than she could ever expect. To fulfill his plan for them to, be, to become an ancestor of Jesus. They left what they had. That what they had might have been good to them, but did they ever know what was great until they started following Christ through obedience, through character, through their morals, through their life, the way they lived their life, got them to the place where God got them into the inheritance of Jesus. All because, all because they were willing to follow the God of Israel. Okay? God is interested in the details of your life. You may not believe it. You may not know it. You may not understand it. You may feel like God's against you. Just because bad things happen don't, be, don't mean God's against you. I mean, there may be something bigger, maybe something better, maybe something different. Not necessarily better, but different. Okay? God always has a plan. Now, it's up to us to not sit on the couch and say, oh, well, God's got it. I'm, uh, God's in control. He's got it. No, 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 no. God wants you to be active in your Christianity, always. It's never sitting and staying and saying, all right, God, do whatever you want. No. It's finding out where God wants you and you getting there. It's always been about us being proactive and following Christ. So, if you need to be saved, if you need to repent, if you are unsure on where you're at with God, these are all things that He will clarify to you if your heart is willing to hear them. If your heart's willing to hear them, He'll, he'll tell you. Be willing to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful to be a Christian today, so thankful to... I didn't have to preach today. Your Word did it. Lord, thank You for giving us Your Word. Thank You for giving us Your conviction, Your Holy Spirit. Help us to follow you closer every day. Um, Lord, for this church, I pray, God, that you'll continue to bless, uh, bless us and that you'll continue to use us. Help us to become that great church that you've called us to be. You didn't call us to be a regular, normal church. You called us to be the church, the church. And, God, I want to be a part of the church. If, we ha if there are people a part of this church that don't want to be a part of the church, God, I pray that you will show them what it means to be out of the church, what, where their life is going. Uh, Father, they may think their life is great, but it's not. It can't be. It can't be. You never created us just to make our own little kingdoms. You created us to build your kingdom. Yeah. So, Father, I pray for those who are not building your kingdom, God, that you will give them a passion to see, uh, see, to see others saved, to see the kingdom built, and to uh, be witnesses of yours, Lord, through this world. 
And uh, as Ruth was a great witness to Boaz, and they, she not only, he not only, he not only seen it, uh, not only heard it, but he's seen it. And uh, Father, it's important that we be seen, um, and people see us do the right things. God, we love you so much. We thank you for Jesus Christ. It's in His name we pray today. Amen.